And if you didn't get handouts, they're in the back there. That might be easier to follow along. If you have a handout, um, you might find that more enticing. Tim Keller, The Resurrection Will Re Restore All Things. Love this book. From his book, Jesus Vindicated. Listen to what Tim Keller writes. I thought this was really awesome. Kind of some things that I've kind of been saying in this series, but he tells the following story. When my wife was growing up, every summer her family spent two weeks at a small compound of cottages on the shores of Lake Erie. Now, the cottages are all gone. In fact, that part of the beach is gone. Whenever she visits that childhood vacation spot, she weeps because she knows the beach is irretrievable. That sense of irretrievability is like a death. And the older we all get, the more we realize that certain losses are irretrievable. They're gone, and that sucks the joy out of our lives. But here's where Christ's resurrection offers something unique. Even, re even religions that promise a kind of spiritual future or spiritual bliss only after consolation for what you've lost, but, but the resurrection of Christ even promises the restoration of what you've lost. Not just consolation for what you've lost, but the resurrection, restoration of what you've lost. You don't just get your body back, you get the body you always wanted, but you never had. You don't just get your life back, you get the life that you always wanted, that you never had. But Jesus Christ is walking proof that you will miss nothing. Nothing. It's all coming in the future. It's going to be unimaginably wonderful. There is no religion, no philosophy, and no human being who can offer this kind of future. And as Christians, our hope for the future is based on the historical fact of the resurrection. So if you are not a Christian, let me ask, why wouldn't you want that? Even if you don't like different aspects of the Christian faith, why wouldn't you want this hope for restoration? You're not being honest with yourself if you don't want that. Redemption, what a beautiful story. And we're going to look again at this incredible story of redemption found in the scriptures. And the fact of the matter is, we have the cry of redemption that comes to us from out the scriptures. And um, I'm not moving down my screen there, Dan. Um, but the cry of redemption comes to us throughout the scriptures, and it starts really the redemptive plan that is unique to our Savior, Christ, and is unique to our faith as Christians, this redemptive plan. You don't find it in other religions that promise this sense of restoration. And this redemptiveness that comes to us and was originally announced back in the Garden of Eden to Adam and Eve. That's, that's how far back it goes. Third chapter of the Bible, this redemptive plan is announced. And it's the cry of the Old Testament scriptures. It is the cry that comes to us from Christ as he hangs on the cross. It's the, it's the cry from the cross to all of humanity, this cry of redemption that will bring a sense of restoration it's an amazing thing. And it's, the, it's really just the cry of the fact that God invites us all into a personal love relationship with Him. And this is really difficult for a lot of people to grasp and understand that God wants a personal relationship with them. The God of the universe loves them that deeply. We, we all know uh, the verse in John three sixteen: for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God gave his son because he loved the world. But then there's this verse, like back in John 15, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Live, dwell in my love. God wants a personal love relationship with you. He wants to be close to you, connected to you each and every day. You could say it like this, Christ died for you because he loved you, and he died for you so that you could love him in return. God wants a two-way, personal, intimate love relationship with you. It's a beautiful thing. And it's the cry of redemption, and it's the cry of the scriptures, and clearly we will see this today as we look through the story of Ruth, as we look and we can see God's beautiful love story Wrapped up in Roman, er, Ruth chapter 3 here, it's throughout the book of Ruth, but Ruth chapter 3, we begin to see the beauty of this love story. Really amazing. Redemption. The redemption story. And so today, let's, let's look, and I want you to see three reasons today why God's plan of redemption, why God's redemptive story is so attractive. It, it, should, just, it should just draw us in to Christ. It should just draw us into this love relationship. Three reasons why it is so attractive. And let's start with the first five verses of Ruth chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, 
my daughter, should I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Is not Boaz our relative, with whose young woman you were? See, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Wash, therefore, and anoint yourself, and put on your cloak, and go down to the threshing floor, but do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. But when he lies down, observe the place where he lies. Then go and uncover his feet and lie down, and he will tell you what to do. And she replied, all that you say I will do. Now remember, I should have done this just a second ago, but just remember the story of Ruth, that Ruth uh, is married to Naomi's son, one of his sons. There's two, there's two daughter-in-laws, Ruth and or- Orpah. And Naomi and her husband and her two sons and the two daughter-in-laws live in Moab. They went to Moab. And in the process of being in Moab, Naomi lost her husband, and then both her sons died. So she has two daughter-in-laws that are widows. And in the end, um, Ruth decides to stick with Naomi. When Naomi turns to her homeland here in Judah, she goes back to Judah with Naomi. And uh, and, uh, she's, remember that famous line, you maybe heard it, uh, your Uh, God will be my God and your people will be my people. And she makes a commitment to stick with uh, her mother-in-law, or her mother-in-law Naomi, and of course to align herself with God. And so here we have, you know, what happens is they get, they get back to, um, to Judah and they, they have no, nothing to eat, no income. And so she goes out in the field and she gleans out in the fields uh, behind the workers, something that the poor people would do. And she picks up the, what's left over after they've gleaned the fields and Boaz is the one who comes out and recognizes her, and um, that's kind of where the story takes place. So what we have here is that there, there's this, this, this thing called the kinsman redeemer. It's, it's the heart of the book of Ruth. It's this thing in the Jewish law. And so, and so what we have here is uh, three reasons why we're, we're going to see today why redemption is so attractive and um, redemption is at the heart of this book. The Kinsman Redeemer is all about redemption, and we'll see what that is again in just a minute. Here's the first thing that we see about redemption, though. Redemption leads to rest. Redemption leads to rest. And she says, my daughter, should I not seek rest for you? Should I not seek your rest? And um, that's Naomi's question to, to Ruth, and it shows us this underlying truth that God's redemption through Christ brings us rest. Now, how would she find this rest? Through the kinsman redeemer, which is, of course, to illustrate for us the work of Jesus Christ, who would come many, many years later. Here is just a simple definition from the um, Baker's Evangelical Dictionary of the Bible that tells us what the kinsman redeemer is. It is a male relative who according to various laws found in the Pentateuch, the Mosaic Law, had the privilege or responsibility to act for a relative who was in trouble, danger, or need of vindication. And that is exactly what Boaz does in this story. As the story unfolds, we'll see this even more so next week in chapter 4. But here's the idea. The kinsman redeemer could deliver or rescue, as he, among other things, would redeem a piece of property, for the poor person, he would buy that property back for them, or he would marry the widow of a deceased relative, and he would continue their family line. He would have children. That's something that was part of the Mosaic Law. And clearly, this is what takes place in the book of Ruth, and we'll see that as the story unfolds and and wraps up next week. So we have this kinsman redeemer here that parallels the redemptive work of Christ in the Bible. But just note what she says to Naomi. Should I not seek rest for you? That if you, have a, if you have a kinsman redeemer, if you have someone that would come and marry you and take you in, would they not pr- pr- provide rest for you? And this is exactly what Christ does for us. That's the promise that we have. Not just the eternal promise that there will be rest in heaven, but what did Jesus say? Come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. You can have rest in this very stressful world. You can find a rest in Christ that will exceed your wildest dreams. Now, how is it that redemption leads to rest? Well, one of the things here, real simply, is that redemption pays this debt that is hanging over my head. There's been a debt hanging over our our head. Ever since Adam and Eve were chased out of the garden of rest back in Genesis chapter 3 because of their sin, there's been this debt hanging over our heads. And redemption, 
Christ on the cross, our kinsman redeemer, takes care of that debt. Here's how the Apostle Paul assesses this role of the kinsman redeemer in our redemption. And you who are dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them. And there's that key line. He canceled the record of debt that was against us. Now this, just, just think about how this works. This kind of works in two ways. First, he cancels the record of debt that is against us. Uh, he, he makes it as if we've never even committed a sin. How awesome is that? How amazing is that? It's like we never even committed a sin, and then he takes away any legal demands that our sin would have had. It's an amazing thing. There is nothing we have to do. There is absolutely nothing we have to do to have a relationship, to enter into that love relationship with God. Nothing. He did it all. He paid it all. He paid the entire price. Now, Think about this. Let me give you three examples here of why this, uh, this whole, this idea of, of rest, how we can find rest. Give me a couple of stressful situations. You know, there are those today trying to pay a debt that they can never pay. There are people today working really hard to pay this debt. And you know what? You can never pay it. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And some people are working to pay this debt, and you can never pay it on your own. Let me give you a paraphrase of this. How about this? The cost of my sin is $100 billion or eternal death in hell. But the free gift of God is, is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And the fact is, the cost of your sin, you want to pay your $100 billion. Well, just a random number. And it's, it's more than that. It's unpayable. That's the point. It's more than Bill Gates or George Soros could pay. You owe more than you could pay. And it's a stressful life when every day you're working really hard to pay this debt and you can never do enough to pay the debt that you own. That's just, just amazing. If you don't pay the debt before you die, you're in trouble. How, how stressful would life be? Can you imagine if you have this huge debt hanging over your head with huger consequences? Hell, if you don't pay this debt off in time. It's an amazing thing. Think about how we can stress about a lot less right? Melissa's dog, Chip, starts losing its hair, you know, just coming off in clumps. And so you have to do the, ine finally you have to do the inevitable. You have to go to the, um, to the vets. Who wants to go to the vets and spend money on the vets on your dog, you know? And, um, but sometimes you have to, and you stress out about even something as simple as that. You know, you get a little vet bill, and it's like, oh, man, you know, the things that can stress us out. Think if you didn't know Christ and you're working to pay a debt that you can never pay. But here's the point. There is a redemptive but in this story. Just notice that. There is a redemptive but. There is a redemptive but. We can't pay the price for our sins, but someone else can. But we don't owe it anymore. That's the beauty of it. We just don't owe it anymore. And some people are working really hard to pay a debt that, that they can never pay. But you don't have to pay it. So all the stress can be taken care of. And then here's another angle on that same kind of thing, that same kind of stress. There are those working to pay a debt that has already been paid. Think about that. People are working hard to pay this debt, and it's already been paid. Romans 14, 12 says, There is a way that seems right to man, but its end is the way of death. Proverbs is the book of wisdom, and so it's not very wise when you're working really hard to pay for something that's already been paid and already been taken care of. Consider it this way. Think of, think of heaven. Just think of heaven. We're like a um, vacation destination. You want to go to heaven. Who wouldn't want to go to heaven and take a vacation? Well, it's better than that. It's not a vacation. You get to spend eternity there. And so you want to go to heaven. You want to spend eternity in heaven. And yet, it costs like $100 billion to, take, to get to heaven. You know, who can afford that? And then you find out the good news. You know what? Somebody already paid your way. Somebody reserved a spot for you in heaven. You can go to heaven. It won't cost you anything. But you know what? Here's the deal. Here's what the Bible says. Most people today, they don't want someone else to pay their way. They want to pay their own way to heaven. 
there's a way that seems right to man, which is working really hard to pay this debt that you can never pay and that's already been paid for you. How foolish, how futile, and how stressful. We spend our life working really hard to pay a debt. And you know what? That's already been paid. You are, you can already, all you have to do is just say you want to go. Someone's already paid your way in to heaven. It's been paid in full. A third angle on this would be then this angle. You think about the rest that redemption gives us. There are those who are living for a greater purpose and reward. There are those living for a greater purpose. Redemption. When it takes all the stress off me and I'm working really hard for all these things that, that, that have no meaning. When I'm working really hard to earn things I can't earn and do things I can't do and working really hard for things I don't need to be doing. It frees me up then to do the work God has created me to do. It frees me up to be the person God has created me to be. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. This is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. There's no way I can do anything to earn this salvation. But look what happens next then. For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. So when I stop trying to do the work that I'm not supposed to do and the work that I could never do, which is earn my salvation, it frees me up to do the work I was created to do. It frees me up to find the purpose that I was created for. God, we think about the beauty of redemption. One of the things, God redeems my purpose in life. He gives me back my purpose, my reason for being here. Because I can work as hard as I want. I can be as good a person as I think I can be. And I'll never be good enough to match up to God's standard to get into heaven. Only Christ can make me good enough to get into heaven. Only Christ can pay the price for my sins. For nearly a decade, thought this was interesting, for nearly a decade, Tiger Woods was the dominant force in pro golf, spending 264 weeks as, number, as world number one. But after a rash of injuries and poor performances, Woods experienced a significant drop in his ranking. In December 2015, the Week magazine reported that Woods was struggling to find his identity after his third back surgery. Woods told reporters, there is really nothing I can look forward to. I am really good at playing video games. That's basically how I pass a lot of my time. How sad is that? One of the world's greatest golfers. And, and this is someone who clearly does not understand redemption. He's either never been redeemed by Christ or he's forgotten that he was redeemed by Christ. And he's lost his sense of purpose in life. And there's nothing to look forward to. Let me tell you, when you're redeemed by Christ and when you live in your redemption every day, you have something to look forward to. You have a hope and a joy and, and you have a, a peace and a rest because redemption leads to rest. It takes the stress out of our life. And this is something, let me tell you, it's something no other religion can offer you. No other religion can offer you that sense of purpose and no other religion has this idea of redemption that can offer you a security and assurance that you know without a doubt if you die, you're going to go and spend eternity in eternal bliss. No other religion promises you that security and that assurance based on what someone else has done for you. Redemption leads to rest. Let's look at a second thing that makes redemption attractive and let's look at Verses 6 and 7 going on here. So she went down to the threshing floor and did as her mother-in-law had commanded her. Now, just think about this. She's going to do what her mom says, her mother-in-law says, which is pretty amazing. And when Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. Then she came softly and uncovered his feet and lay down. At midnight, the man was startled and turned over, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And he said, may you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this first kindness greater than the first, in that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And now, my daughter, do not fear. I will do for you all that you ask, for all my fellow townsmen know that you are a worthy woman. And now it is true that I am a redeemer. Yet there is a redeemer nearer than I, Remain tonight and in the morning. If he will redeem you, good, let him do it. But if he is not willing to redeem you, then as the Lord lives, I will redeem you. Lie down until the morning. Okay, 
here's the, the second thing about redemption that makes it so attractive, is that redemption makes room for our response. Redemption makes room for our response. Redemption wants us to respond. Redemption doesn't come along, and Christ doesn't come along and just say, you know, you will be saved. It says, do you want to be saved? It gives you an option. It gives you the choice. It really does. Redemption does not intimidate, intimidate you into his family. God does not intimidate you into his family. He loves you into his family. Think about that. God does not scare you into his family or force you into his family. He loves you into his family, wants a personal love relationship with you, and redemption says you have a choice in the matter. Would you like to be redeemed? And we all have to make a personal choice. No one can make that choice for us. In a recent Rolling Stone interview, the richest man in the world, Bill Gates, 58, was asked, do you believe in God? Gates said that he believes science has now filled in some explanations for disease and the weather. But after admitting that science can't explain everything, Gates shared an intriguing co comment about his openness to God. The mystery and the beauty of the world is overwhelmingly amazing, and there's no scientific explanation of how it came about. To say that it was generated by random numbers, that does, does seem, you know, sort of an uncharitable view. I think it makes sense to believe in God, but exactly what decision in your life you make differently because of it, I don't know. The simple fact is God's redemption is awaiting a response. God's redemption is an invitation to every single person on the face of the earth. And here's the deal. Bill Gates, for instance, can see God in creation, respond to God in creation. And, and here's the thing, though, is that God actually wants us to respond to him when it comes to redemption. Creation just points us to a creator who has redeemed us, who went to the cross, and that's who we respond to. You can look at creation and say, well, I think there's a God out there somewhere that ain't good enough. You look and you find the God of creation who then points you to the cross and points you to redemption and points you to how you can have a personal love relationship with the creator of the entire universe. Now, I want to look at all three characters a minute, Naomi, Ruth, and Boaz. And here's the thing that we want to ask ourselves this morning. This is the thing that is so in, intriguing when you look at the story in each one of them and the role they play in the story. We're going to see God's love story unfold here. And here's the first thing that I think is interesting is you have Naomi and you have what I would call the scandalous plan. Does anybody read the story and think like me, what's Naomi thinking? What's, what in the world's on her mind? And, and for Ruth to do what Naomi says, what's, I mean, you know, you realize what she did, right? In the middle of the night, Ruth goes into this guy's bedroom and climbs in bed with him. I mean, what's she doing? Is she propositioning him for some sex or what? You know, what's she doing? Middle of the night. And the guy rolls over in the middle of the night and he's like, what are you doing in my bed? <laughs> Can you just, just imagine that? Can you just Im imagine that unfolding? And so we have this kind of a scandalous plan. It's a very provocative, very suggestive kind of plan. What's her purpose for being there? And if you don't think it's scandalous, at the end of this story, Boaz is going to say to Ruth, you need to sneak out of my room and no one's supposed to know that she was here. No one should know she was in my bedroom last night. Um, make sure that is kept quiet. This would be a scandalous thing indeed. Now here's the deal. Uh, Boaz represents Christ. And if the plan seems a bit scandalous, you know what? Christ, when he was on earth, was a pretty scandalous individual. He, he stirred a lot of controversy up. His grace was quite scandalous. Matthew eleven nineteen, 19, speaking of Jesus Christ, the Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, look at him, a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners, yet wisdom is justified by her deeds. And they looked at Jesus and said, whoa, and you call yourself God. And they were just, he was a scandalous individual. How about the story of the prodigal son? Back in Romans 15, did you know the story of the prodigal son was a scandalous story? How many ever realized that? Back in the day. Now, when he was telling it, it wasn't so scandalous until it got to the scandalous kind of ending. But the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. So there's two people here. You've got the unrighteous. And the unrighteous, when he tells the story of the prodigal son and how this prodigal ended up in the pig pen eating pig slop because of his great sin, and the unrighteous all related. They say, Hey, I've been there, done that. 
That's what happens when you, yeah, that's my life. How do I get out of the pig pen? They all related to it. And, and the self-righteous, the religious elite, they heard the story and they all celebrated. It's like, yeah, that's the way it should work. If you don't live a right, li- righteous life, you should end up in a pig's, pig's pen. And they all celebrated. And then the story comes of that climactic, climactic kind of controversial, kind of scandalous ending. And at the end, the unrighteous is having a party with God and the self-righteous brother is outside. He's angry. He didn't go into the party. And what a scandalous story. Scandalous that God would extend grace and that he would have a party for the unrighteous. Scandalous that God would even party. God doesn't party. He's not that kind of guy. A scandalous story. And so Naomi has this plan for Ruth, and it seems a bit scandalous. So what's the point of her story? What's the point of this, 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 this scandalous story she has today, or that she has for Ruth? The redemptive plan calls any and everyone, regardless of your past, your present, and regardless of the color of your sin, calls you into a relationship with Christ, and it is indeed a scandalous story. The redemptive plan invites one and all to the redemptive party. But still, we ask ourselves, what was, what was Naomi thinking with this bold and this risky and this scandalous plan? Well, let's see what she was thinking. Why, why did she come up with this plan? If you remember, Boaz came, comes back home, back in chapter 2. We'll go back to chapter 2 in a minute to understand why Naomi did what she did. So back in chapter 2, Boaz returns home, he was gone in Bethlehem, he returns home, and immediately he sees this woman, young woman Ruth, out in the field, tending in the field behind the gleaners, working, and he he watches her out there working, and he immediately is drawn to her, and he eventually goes and speaks to her, here's the first things that he has to say to this, um, the first thing that he has to say to uh, Ruth as she's out there in his field, he comes to her, and um, Sorry about that. I get ahead of myself sometimes. Uh, so Ruth chapter 2, Boaz said to Ruth, here's his first words to her, Boaz said to Ruth, Now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young woman. Let your eyes be on the field that they are reaping and go after them. Have I not charged the young men not to touch you? And when you are thirsty, go to the vessels and drink what the young men have drawn. Immediately Boaz is looking out for Ruth. Immediately Boaz is protecting her. Eventually he'll be providing for her. Ruth asks Boaz, why are you being so nice to me? Why are you extending such kindness to me? And Boaz makes it clear that he has heard about her character, her reputation, and her story. She has faithfully stuck by Naomi. She made a huge sacrifice and showed a deep commitment to both Naomi and to God. And this this, this really just made her very attractive to him. So Boaz then says something very interesting in, in, in chapter in verse 12 of, of chapter 2. The Lord repay you for what you have done, and a full reward be given you by the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Now what is so fascinating about this verse here, what he says here, is it paralyzes something that Ruth says on this scandalous evening in Boaz's bedroom. Here's what Ruth says. Uh, she goes into his bedroom that night. She said, he said, who are you? And she answered, I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. And there's a great parallel there with that concept of, of finding protection and, and having someone's wings spread over her. So, so what is going on? Here's why I believe Naomi suggested such a bold, risky, and even scandalous move. Here's why I believe he did it. Could it simply be that Boaz made the first move? Could it be that back there in chapter 2, Boaz made the first move? Boaz was ex- extremely kind to her. He even had her sit at his table that first evening, and she ate there at his table. At the end of the day, after supper, Ruth goes home and recounts the day to to Naomi, moment by moment, word for word, and action after action, telling her what transpired that day. Could it not be that Naomi picked up on some subtle hints that maybe Ruth missed out on? And as she tells the story back to Naomi, Naomi says, you know what? 
I think this guy likes you. I think this guy has been taken by you, smitten by you. Now, you have to understand, just think about this, because here is Boaz, a much older man, with Ruth, a much younger woman, so he can't come right out and say that he is interested in her, but he may have subtly been dropping hints. And if Boaz represents Christ, then he does, we know that we have also captured the heart of Christ, just as Ruth captured the heart of Boaz. We know how kind that Christ has been to us, and how kind was Boaz indeed to Ruth. In fact, what's really interesting, we look at the story, and the truth is Naomi did not send Ruth to Boaz to seduce him sexually. In fact, the, care, the, 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 the context of the, of the text here seems to point out the fact that Boaz was drawn to Ruth because of her character, and likewise, Ruth was drawn to Boaz because of his character, because of his kindness and his protection and his provision. It was their godly character that drew them to one another. And so what that means then is that Ultimately, that Ruth, Ruth enters his room that night with a kind response. She comes with a kind response. She comes responding to this one who she thinks, she's not sure, but she thinks is interested in her. She's not entirely sure of what he's thinking, but she's pretty confident that he is interested in her. And she comes in her own way saying, yes, take me, protect me, provide for me, make me your own. I am Ruth, your servant. Spread your wings over your servant, for you are a redeemer. Will you be my redeemer? I've come seeking refuge under the wings of God, and you will be those wings for me. If you want more evidence that this is kind of what tra- is transpiring, listen to what, listen to, um, uh, listen to what um, Boaz says. Boaz says this, May you be blessed by the Lord, my daughter. You have made this last kindness greater than the first and that you have not gone after young men, whether poor or rich. And so here's the, what was the first kindness? The first kindness was probably she stumbled into his his field and was gleaning at his field. That's the first kindness. What's the second kindness? The fact that she didn't chase after the young men, but that she came to Boaz. Even though he was much older than her, she came to Boaz and sought him out. The point here is that our redemption is attractive because it is not something that is forced on us. And I put a quote here. This is my own quote, but it's like this. Redemption is our choice. It is our free will response to God. We don't, though, ask God to be our redeemer. That's not the correct terminology to use. Christ, who sought us out, is our redeemer. He has forgiven us, past tense, at the cross. He has redeemed us. He has set us free. Now the choice is ours. Do we want to be free? You see, Christ did the seeking, not me. He did the redeeming, certainly not me. And he does the asking again, not me. He does all of the work. I just say yes or no. Beauty of redemption, he does it all. He asks me, I don't ask him. He asks me and I just respond yes or no. Our redemption is indeed scandalous when you consider our past. Each of us have a past that is in some way scandalous. But he takes our scandalous past away. He cancels any debt that we owe. We are free to boldly come to him in faith. Boldly come to him in faith. Karl Barth preached regularly to the inmates of the prison in his hometown of Basel, Switzerland. Knowledge of that context adds poignancy to the sermons. Here was an audience of people who had been officially judged and condemned as guilty. One of the sermons is based on Ephesians 2.8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. He illustrated by retelling a Swiss legend. You probably all know the legend of the writer who crossed the frozen lake of Constance by night without knowing it. When he reached the opposite shore and was told whence he came, he broke down horrified. This is the human situation. When the sky opens and the earth is bright, when we may hear, by grace you have been saved. In such a moment, we are like that terrified writer. When we hear the, this world, we involuntarily look back. Do we not? Asking ourselves, where have I been? Over an abyss in mortal danger. What did I do? The most foolish thing I ever attempted. What happened? I was doomed and miraculously escaped, and now I am safe. In the same way, everyone who is trusting Christ for salvation by grace alone can say, I was in mortal danger, I was doomed, but through the cross of Christ, I miraculously escaped, and now 
I am saved. Wow, how amazing is that? And we can all say that. And when you ever think about your life that way, you think whenever you got saved, if boy, if I had died five years earlier, I would have spent eternity in hell. And you look back and you think, wow, look what I escaped. <clears throat> because I came to Christ, because I responded to his call before I left this world. Redemption is attractive because it doesn't force us into God's family, intimidate us into God's family. He just loves us into God's family. It says the choice is yours. Have you responded to Christ? Have you said yes to him? That's all you got to do. Right there in your seat, you can say yes. I want to know for sure Christ is mine. And then the last thing that makes it so attractive here today, the last thing that makes it so attractive today is this, is that, is that redemption gives me a boldness before God and before man. Redemption just does something to us, and it gives us a boldness before God and before man. And, and, and here's the point. Okay, do you ever stop and look at this and think, okay, I understand Naomi had this plan. I understand that Ruth bought into it. I understand that Ruth snuck into his bedroom. Did you ever stop and ask yourself, but where did she, where did she get the guts to do that? Where did she get the boldness to actually carry that plan out? Well, I think, you know, actually, I think, here's the deal. In the story of Ruth, Boaz represents Christ and tells the story of redemption. But here's the truth. For Ruth, her true redemption, I believe her true redemption came at the outset. Um, her true redemption came at the outset when she said those famous words, um, your God will be my God and your people will be my people. When she chose to align herself with God, when she stuck with Naomi and, and she left her homeland and, and she gave up her homeland and her family to travel to Judah, to align herself with Yahweh and with Yahweh's people and to stay by Naomi's side. That's when she, I believe, really entered into a relationship with God the Father. And that's when she was really redeemed. Of course, her redemption is based on what Christ did years later on the cross. All the Old Testament saints were redeemed through the cross that happened hundreds of years later. But the reality is for Ruth, that's when she entered into a relationship with God. And what gave her the boldness to carry out Naomi's plan? God gives us that kind of boldness. When we enter into a relationship with God, He empowers us, He emboldens us to be in the center of His will. He emboldens us to do the things that in, in the end will give us a great reward and a great blessing. Ruth is going to be incredibly blessed because she followed through on this scandalous plan and snuck into Boaz's room. We'll see it all unfold next week in chapter 4. But that's where her truest redemption lies. But the reality is, 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 is that the boldness that she walked into Boaz's room with, that's just a reflection of what our redemption does for us. It gives us that kind of boldness before God, and it gives us a kind of a boldness before man. Here's how it works. In the Old Testament, and I've told this story before, but bear with me a minute. In the Old Testament, okay, they would go in every year to the uh, Holy of Holies and they would offer that sacrifice for the atonement of sins, the atonement sacrifice for sins. And the priest would go in there and offer that sacrifice for the people. And only the high priest could go in and he would go in there and he would have bells, remember, on his tassels that would jingle. And he would have a rope around his leg, remember? He would go in there, the bells jingling and dragging the rope behind him. And, and what happened is when he went in there with the bells jingling, as if those bells ever stopped jingling... Something bad went wrong in the Holy of Holies. Because, see, the wages of sin is death. And what was happening was the, the high priest went into the Holy of Holies to pay the wage of sin temporarily until Christ went to the cross and paid it once for all. He went in there temporarily paying the wages of sin, offering that sacrifice. If something didn't go right in there, that high priest would die right in the Holy of Holies. And not anybody could march into the Holy of Holies and drag the body out. So they had a rope around him, so they would drag the rope out and drag the body out, and uh, yeah, so you didn't want to hear those bells stop jingling, you, you, you know, you didn't want to have to pull on the rope and drag him out, and I'm sure, I was thinking about that again, what would be, if you're the priest and you're going into the Holy of Holies to do that, what's your number one emotion you're probably feeling when you walk in there to do that sacrifice? Number one emotion, you're probably, <laughs> I hope this goes well, <laughs> I hope God accepts this, I hope I'm okay with God, and there's probably fear consuming you. And I'm sure you walk out and you're like, Whew. Oh. next year, Wayne, it's your turn. <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> you got a next year, and Ken, you the year after that, you know. <laughs> oh, what a scary thing. And so here's the deal. 
The Bible teaches us that when Christ went to the cross and he died on the cross and he was crucified on the cross, something happens halfway through that crucifixion. What happens? The veil in the temple, the, 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 the curtain that separated into the Holy of Holies that kept people out, it was ripped in two. Signifying we no longer need anybody to go into the Holy of Holies for us. We never again need to go in there trembling in fear before God that we might be struck dead because something won't go right. Because Christ has made it all right once and for all. And we can come boldly before God each and every day. We can dwell in the Holy of Holies each and every day because of what Christ did for us. It gives us a boldness in our relationship with God. And it gives us a boldness before man. It's an amazing thing. Here's the passage. It explains it in Scripture. Therefore, brothers, in Hebrews, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Christ has given us boldness across the board. It's an amazing thing. It's an amazing thing what God has done for us when he died on the cross. I'll give you three simple examples here. Three, what this boldness looks like, just real quickly. A boldness in my worship, despite my struggles. I can be going through the worst things in life, and because of Christ and his redemption, I can have a boldness in this world that will just amaze people. How many know the first book of the Bible um, that uh, chronologically transpires? Or the first book of the Bible written, I should say. Huh? The first book of the Bible written is the book of Job. Now, Genesis deals with older material than Job, but Job is the first book of the Bible written. That's how old the book of Job is. Job is the story of the guy who lost everything. Remember, he lost his wife, and he lost his kids, and he lost all his possessions, and lost his health, and he lost his friends, and he, just, he lost everything except his faith. And he is one who somehow managed to continually worship God. And there's a verse tucked away in the book of Job that is so fun. I think this is the first book of the Bible ever written. Back there in the book of Job. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. Job, the first book of the Bible, speaks about a Redeemer who would come thousands of years later. A, a Redeemer that would stand upon the earth in, in, the, in the final and make everything right in the end. Restore it all in the end. And he could worship God despite losing everything because of his Redeemer. Because he had that, re that, that eternal perspective that his Redeemer would give to him. There's a boldness in my worship despite my struggles. There's a boldness in my witness despite my fears. Just the ability that we have to stand up and tell the world that we love Christ. To stand up and tell the world that we're one of God's children. That can overcome my fear. When I'm consumed by my redemption and my redeemer, it can overcome my fears. I can speak up. I can speak out. I can boldly, this is Ruth, boldly enter Boaz's bedroom. I can boldly speak out wherever I am. Because the power of Christ, because the, the love of Christ compels me. It's an amazing thing, the bol a boldness in my witness despite any of my fears. God empowers me. And then finally, a boldness in my walk despite my sin. Despite the fact that I live in this fleshly carcass that is certainly at times inclined to sin. My redemption says I am worthy not because of what I have done. I am worthy because of what Christ has done for me once and for all at the cross. I can walk with boldness in my step. I can walk boldly right into the throne of grace. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us at the proper time. And we may sin sometimes and we may fall sometimes, we may blow it sometimes, but I can have boldness to come back to God. Boldness. Because He has made me who I am. Because He is my identity. Because that sin does not define me 
it does not dictate my future. So we're heading into communion here this morning. But let me just let me just ask you this morning, let's just take a moment and pray before communion here. Because here's the reality. God's asking each one of us this morning, and I never assume that everybody has, has made this decision or said yes to Christ. And this morning, God is just asking each one of us in our own hearts. He's saying, do you want to be redeemed? Do you want to get back everything you lost? Do you want to get back what you didn't even know you ever had? Do you want me to redeem your purpose in life? Do you want me to give you rest? Do you want me to give you boldness in this world? All you have to do in your heart of hearts is say yes. I want to be redeemed. Yes, I, I, I believe you went to the cross for me, that you died there for me, that you paid a price that I can never pay. You have paid that price for me. In my pride, I'm not going to try to pay something I can't pay. I'm not going to try to pay something you've already paid because of my pride. I'm going to humbly this morning, simply in my heart, say, Christ, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my Redeemer. I acknowledge, I acknowledge that I'm a sinner. I acknowledge I have wronged a holy God. And I believe you went to the cross and you died there for my sin. And I ask you to come in this morning and be my Savior and be my life and be my resurrection and be my hope. In Jesus' name.